This episode is brought to you by Paraswap, the leading aggregator to find best prices across various DEXs. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Hi. Um, you know, at the beginning of 2020, there was roughly 20 billion of stable coins, and we ended the year at, at a quarter trillion. Uh, I think stable coins are on their way to becoming a, you know, a multi-trillion dollar market. All right, guys, today we are joined by Ben Foreman. Ben is A, a longtime friend of BlockWorks, uh, but B, more importantly, Ben is the managing partner of Parify Capital, uh, a fund that invests in blockchain technology and DeFi markets. Ben founded Parify in 2018 after, I think, a decade. Uh, maybe I'm wrong there, but I think a decade of working in private equity and credit markets at major firms like KKR and TPG. So, Ben, welcome to Empire, my friend. Yeah, thank you. It's great to, great to be on. Let's get into it. I mean, this is a crazy, crazy, crazy day to be recording a podcast. Ben, we're so lucky to have you here today. The entire market cap is down about 10%. Some of the uh, kind of coins that are more out on the risk spectrum, Avalanche is down 15%, Polkadot down 13%, Luna down 12%, Solana down 14%. Really insane day to be recording this. I want to take you back 18 months, actually almost two years ago, uh, when I jumped on, you guys were laughing about March 12th, 2020. I would, say, I would say one half of your face was laughing, the other half was crying. Take us back to uh, March 12th, 2020. What was that day like? How crazy was that for you? Yeah, I remember waking up at four in the morning. I, at the time, had a bad habit of checking my, my phone, checking crypto prices a couple of times a night. And um, I, I'd gotten a text from Santiago saying, you know, take a look at the markets. And Bitcoin had taken a leg down from 9K to 6K, uh, so 33% move. Alts were down more like 40, 50%. Um, on really no, you know, I think it was a little bit of a macro scare, similar today with, you know, the Fed turning a little bit more hawkish. That theme was prevalent at the time, but more so related to the coronavirus and the uncertainty as, as the virus started to permeate different, different countries. And um, the first part of that day, that 30% move down in Bitcoin, the market absorbed it. OTC desks made margin calls, borrowers made margin, posted collateral, um, and uh, things seemed to be orderly again. But it was that second move in the afternoon when Bitcoin went from 6K down to 3K that, I mean, it literally almost broke DeFi. We, we were on the phone with uh, you know, MakerDAO for most of the day, DAI, which is a stable coin, was trading at a dollar and twenty cents. The system wasn't performing liquidations um, properly, and um, it's easy to think back to, to those moments where you know DeFi almost didn't happen, MakerDAO almost collapsed, and probabilistically, if ETH had broken eighty dollars below eighty dollars, like you know DeFi may not be where it is today. Um, so somehow, some way. You know, the system survived, DeFi survived. And um, I mean, in retrospect, like each kind of each day like that makes the system more robust, more anti-fragile. And today, um, you know, days like today uh, feel, um, you know, days like today are kind of two to four time a year events and feel feel a little bit more tolerable. And the system just feels like there are more market participants. The infrastructure is actually working very well. And I think from my standpoint, and, and I'm, you know, I would say I'm an investor, not a trader, but I, I think, you know, long term, all the secular trends around crypto still feel, you know, as good as candidly, as good as they've ever felt. Ben, I want to get your framework for what we're seeing today. So today we're recording this. What is it? Friday, January 21st. Uh, the market is down about 10 percent. Right. Bitcoin, uh, you know, we, we already kind of went through some of these numbers. Solana down 13%, Bitcoin down 10%, ETH down 12.5%. What is your almost macro framework for how you're viewing the markets, uh, crypto, almost like the state of the cycle that we're in right now? It'd be helpful to hear your uh, framework for how you're viewing all of this. Yeah, de definitely. I mean, look, I, I think I, I kind of come at it from a couple different angles. I think the first is, uh, you know, crypto today, liquid crypto is a, a $2 trillion asset class. If you add in kind of the, the, the total market for private tokens and the total market for um, companies in the space, maybe you get to two and a half to, to three trillion total. Um, 
that's against uh, a global asset base of six hundred trillion dollars. So we're you know, crypto today is roughly fifty bips of, of global assets. So it's very small. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm of the mind that crypto kind of will grow over the coming years to three, five, ten percent, and, and eventually become you know one of the largest asset classes. Um, and, and really, that's like driven by two different things. One is uh, you know growth within existing crypto categories. So decentralized money like Bitcoin, you know, getting becoming larger, uh, you know, layer one operating systems growing, DAOs accruing value, but also, um, you know, existing assets being put in the file format of a token. So whether it's, uh, you know, hard assets or tokenizing treasuries or equities, um, that will also contribute to the total market value of, of crypto. I mean, stable coins are, are a perfect example. Stable coins today, there's 250 billion of, of stable coins across all, all chains. That is greater than the total crypto market cap at the end of 2018. Um, so I think you know that's that's going to grow. So I think overall there's a big beta um, beta play here as crypto kind of absorbs different parts of of, of kind of the uh, traditional asset stack. Um, the, the other kind of way we we look at the space is we're, we're very interested in just DAOs and the unit economics of DAOs and how powerful they are. Um, so if you kind of think about, uh, you know, the most profitable businesses of, of the last 20 years, it's really been software because they have, uh, you know, low, very low marginal costs, high cash flow. They don't require any physical assets, but you can sell the same product over and over again. Um, and DAOs are, are really software businesses, but on on steroids, they're very capital efficient to launch. Um, you can access global audiences. Many of them are, you know, close to 100% free cash flow margin businesses. So I, you know, at Parify, we like we we really view that as being deeply underappreciated. And I, I think as you look at the space today, I mean, there are names that in the market that are trading at sub 10, sub 20 times earnings that are growing users, protocol earnings you know, very quickly year over year. It's very difficult to find that combination of growth and value in other asset classes. Um, so that, that's kind of the other, the, other, the other angle we take. So there's kind of the, the more micro underwriting of DAOs and then against this backdrop of, I think crypto is an asset class you know, growing meaningfully. Um, I'm curious, like, what are you seeing right now, DeFi? What gets you excited? Or are you like also pursuing other themes like hey, NFTs, Web3, gaming, like some other stuff? You know, obviously Parify, you know, has made its name, I think, because we're early in DeFi and, and when no one kind of believed it, it wasn't even a category, right? Um, but you're a power user, right? And so I'm curious what you're seeing and what gets you excited. One of like the features of DeFi and the space overall is it's very easy to launch experiments. So you get very rapid feedback loops and a lot of things don't make sense or don't work. So uh, as I look at you know DeFi today, I think there are a number of really interesting categories that are solving real problems, and then I see other more experimental ideas that um, probably aren't going to be around uh, long term, but maybe we'll learn something from them. Um, so th that's kind of how I see it. I I keep on coming back to um, as I think about like kind of the next wave of growth in, in DeFi, I really come back to um, uh, one thing, which is stable coins. And I, I think stable coins uh, were um, one of the, the, the market kind of focused on stable coin growth in 2020, but the narrative kind of shifted away in 2021, um, despite uh, the significant growth in, in stable coin supply. Um, you know, at the beginning of 2020, there was roughly 20 billion of stable coins, and we ended the year at, at a quarter trillion. Uh, I think stable coins are on their way to becoming a, you know, a multi-trillion dollar market. And uh, stable coins are, are really the substrate for everything in crypto. It's, they're the substrate for uh, NFTs, for play to earn, for gaming. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine crypto scaling without stable coins scaling um, commensurately. Um, and so I, I, as I look at the stable coin landscape, I mean, they're really, it, it's wide open in my mind. Because we're, the, the, the new you know, uh, global financial system will not be run um, on top of uh, you know, uh, like kind of uh, circles, you know, uh, liabilities or circle IOUs. It's just not practical. Um, 
So really, it's 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 a four horse race right now, as I see it, between probably Dai, UST, Frax, and um, and MIM, and maybe there are a few others like on the longer tail. But um, it's it, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how that market evolves and plays out, particularly um, uh, you know just particularly how fast that segment of the market is is growing, and I think the rewards for getting. For, for owning kind of the, the central the decentralized central bank of stable coins is, is one of the largest um, TAMs in, in crypto. So you see USDC and Tether going away because they're still these centralized, centralized stable coins. And it sounds like you're really excited about this decentralized stable coin market that is completely crypto native. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Because I think ultimately centralized stable coins have been very useful as trading pairs and kind of getting crypto to where it is today, but ultimately um, they're bank IOUs. So, you know, Circle and Tether are investing them in commercial paper, uh, short-term kind of fixed income instruments, and there's counterparty risk. And there's also, you don't have the same censorship resistance that you would have with, um, you know, with, with these other decentralized stable coins. I guess just last question here on, on the decentralized tables here, Ben, is it feels, yeah, it feels like you have kind of four horses in this race. You've got Frax, Dai, uh, MIM, and UST. Uh, obviously, UST is plugged into this like massively growing Terra Luna ecosystem. MIM feels a little more like, I mean, the name is like magical internet money. So it's like a little uh, more like internet crypto native. Uh, Dai has obviously been around since like what, late 2017. And then you have Frax, which is this like, big brain, collateral, algorithmic, stable coin technology type of thing. Which one of those seems the most likely to win out in this game? Like, are, and I guess, I guess the secondary question there is like, do they all have different use cases? Is it a winner take all market? What, like, what does the decentralized stable coin market look like, you know, maybe three, five years out from now? Yeah. So I, I think, you know, they, they each have a slightly, they each make different trade-offs. Um, so I think if you think about like UST, um, uh, Terra is both a, a stable coin and a layer one ecosystem um, that is, is really built around promoting the adoption and use of that, of that stable coin. I think as you think about the stability of the UST peg and um, the, like, you know, the Lindy of that network, I think it's, it's you know, there was a recent poll on Twitter which asked, hey, if you had to hold one stable coin for 10 years, you know what? What would you hold between you know those four we just we just mentioned, and um, Dai actually ended up being voted the highest because um, in a sense Dai is almost like this meta stable coin. So it has a number of other stable coins backing it. The system is very over collateralized. There's a mechanism to maintain the peg. So I think that that's helpful, but it's also scaling kind of more slowly than its peers, um, given Luna just has this broad ecosystem of Web two companies. That are building applications that will be using UST. Um, so there's like a, probably more organic growth outside of Dai today and in other areas. And then I think I think Frax and MIM are, are probably the two dark horses. Um, you know, MIM is much more crypto native. Um, a lot of the activity is heavily incentivized today with their spell token. Uh, so it's and, and the system just hasn't had the same. They're they're moving very fast and and being aggressive, which I think is is, is a good thing. Um, but I think it's still um, it's still a little bit of a show me story, and then uh, and then Frax Frax I think is 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 one of the more interesting projects in, in all of crypto, just the ingenuity around kind of how they're you know how they're scaling the hustle around getting integrations into all the major all the major um, you know DeFi primitives including um, you know getting picked up by Convex Finance recently uh, I think is 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 fascinating. Um, and they may be growing on a percentage basis faster than, than any of the four. Um, so I, I think, and in, in terms of like what it looks like long-term, you know, my, my hunch is, uh, you know, this is a category that is going to have power law, a power law distribution where you probably don't need, um, you know, five stable coins, like a more oligopolistic, you know, structure. Um, because the more li most liquid stable coin tends to get the most integrations, with, which further kind of creates this feedback loop of making it the most liquid, making it the most accepted, making it the most trusted. And so I think that kind of like leads me to believe that you're, you know, maybe you'll have one or two, maybe there'll be some bifurcation by geography or by layer one, but um, I'd expect 
kind of the survival, like the survival rate of that cohort to be, you know, 50% or less. I want to go back to one, one thing that I, I, I think is interesting. And why do you think DeFi tra traded the way it did relative to ETH, um, given the fundamental traction that we saw over the last nine months? Um, when you look at P ratios, I mean, there's a number of metrics that you could look at. Okay, maybe users are like probably the, the one that you can point to. Some of these systems have like 10 users and, you know, but still uh, a lot of these like, you know, protocols like Aave, um, you know, Uniswap, um, even Sushi, you could argue like, you know, that there's in any kind of environment, there's volume, uh, there's activity and increasingly so. Um, and so, but, but nonetheless, you know, it, 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 the market sort of decided that the L1 trade was more popular, uh, on what you could argue is just, you know, a lot of, a lot of marketing, but not so much kind of fundamental organic, uh, demand. And, um, uh, but I'm curious, like, you know, sort of something that I do wonder, like, why did DeFi trade, you know, relative to ETH the way that it did? Yeah. I, I think it's a confluence of, of a few different things. Um, I, I think one is there's, there's a hot ball of money in crypto, maybe 25 to 50 billion that just chases narratives that will be in the, the latest farm that will jump into the 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 you know latest nft mint um that will you know kind of buy the more go go risky you know right tail of the market and as the market kind of sentiment i think move away from defi to nfts um you know you you saw you, you saw a lot of these defi names become value traps where you know they were trading at maybe 30 40 times earnings uh, and earnings were growing, but then you know you saw multiple compression as as capital kind of moved to the next to the next wave. So I think that was one factor. I think the other is look, a lot of these networks were, were very heavily incentive it incentivized a lot of the activity where you had kind of poorly designed crypto economics and uh, farming rewards that were just getting uh, dumped by by you know industrial mercenary farmers across these networks. Um, like clockwork, and that produced kind of additional selling pressure. And then that compounded with, um, you know, investor unlocks that really started to hit the market um, in Q3 and Q4 of this year. Um, so if you think about like a lot of the private funding for DeFi was really, it really started to pick up like mid 2020. And a lot of those deals had one year lockups. Um, and then, you know, started, you, you had kind of vesting periods. And so as we, we, we looked kind of internally and tried to quantify, if you look across kind of a lot of the major uh, first generation DeFi networks, just the dollar amount of vested tokens come from founders and investors that were hitting the market each month. And it was, it was a pretty meaningful kind of overhang that the market needed to absorb. So I think it was like those, those dynamics that really pushed the market down. Um, and, you know, like my, my sense is, you know, uh, markets can diverge from fundamentals in, over short periods of time. I think over long periods of time, markets need to bend towards fundamentals. Um, and um, to, to me, it's it's um, and, and and to me, like as I think about like you know, if we're entering a new new part of the cycle, if we are in a bear market cycle, I think that DeFi will, will probably outperform other other areas of the market because most of the activity in DeFi is really stablecoin driven. And as the market turns, people want to own stables and these networks earn fees by stablecoin trading, stablecoin lending, stablecoin borrowing. Um, and so that should, that should, I think, cause DeFi to maybe perform slightly more resiliently than say, you know, play to earn or other parts of the uh, stack, you know, this company. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to get your perspective on one thing, which is you, you start a Parify, uh, I think, and I've heard you say this and probably right before the bubble burst or right around it was bursting. And in many ways, that was probably a blessing in disguise because you had the capital probably to, you know, you know, invest into the market and into fear. Um, where do you see this barometer in the market? Like some people are saying, look, you know, Nasdaq's down 10, 12 percent. You know, ETH has and Bitcoin have higher beta than that. This is a very much still a risk on asset class. It's not uncorrelated. So anyone that says that this is uncorrelated, you know, is just kidding themselves. Maybe in the long term, but you know, still it hurts, right? And so I am curious, like, how do you think about kind of weathering any potential, um, you know, downturn in broader markets, uh, in macro environment? You know, I think, and and managing kind of your investments and the portfolio. Yeah, I, I think there are a few different a few different things to to think about. I mean, one is. I think it's it's really important to um, decide if you're an investor or a trader. 
because I think trying to do both like like tempts tempts one to make make mistakes. Um, so we you know we we take a, an investing approach. We're long term. We look for we we look for things that we think are going to compound over multi year periods where we have you know deep conviction. And I think I think it's really about building conviction um, and be, giving yourself an opportunity to win. So I think building conviction is really knowing the ins and outs of these networks, uh, uh, how the, the token economics work, the key catalysts, speaking to the teams, staying updated on everything that's going on, understanding not only like individual projects, but also the competitors. Um, and I think that conviction just is, is the most valuable thing you can have in, in across any market environment, because you end up, you know, you end up being very comfortable when the market trades down. Um, so I, I think that that conviction and building that conviction is 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 extremely critical. And we say like you know we uh, you know I think there's a temptation in crypto to try to get every trade to try to be a part of everything. And I've, I'm certainly like guilty of it. But I think the the right approach to this market is um, it's better to know a handful of things really well than try to get you know 30, 40, 50 things right. Um, if you're like a six out of ten on depth of knowledge on 50 things, it's not as valuable as being a nine and a half or 10 out of 10 on three to five things. Um, and so that I think is, is really the most important thing that, that we keep in mind. Um, and then, um, and look, I, I think, you know, I think having long-term capital has always been a, a blessing for um, uh, a lot of funds in the space, I think are structured in the right way. So they're either closed end venture funds that have, you know, 10 year life, um, or they're tend to be open-ended hedge funds with longer lockup periods. And that just allows you to be very comfortable amidst market volatility um, and assuming you're not running with leverage. And I think most, most kind of more fundamental venture-oriented firms in the space tend to not run with leverage at all or run with a very marginal amount. And so I just think you know, being able to be very patient in times like this, I think is, is, is important. Empire is proud to be supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is one of the leading DEX aggregators in crypto. Let's say you're booking a flight. You would never go directly to an airline, right? You'd never go directly to United or Delta. You'd obviously go to Google Flights or Expedia or Kayak or Booking.com. That's what Paraswap does for DeFi. Paraswap, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see the platform. Paraswap makes swapping easier, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper by aggregating more than 80 different DEXs. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, Uniswap, Sushi, Balancer, uh, Bancor into one single interface. You can use Paraswap on ETH, Polygon, as you can see here, BSC, they recently launched Avalanche a few weeks ago, pretty exciting. If you are a trader listening to this, you are losing money by not using Paraswap. And excitingly enough, if you're a company or a platform looking to access the swapping or the yield capabilities of DEXs, you can now use Paraswap's APIs to integrate into your platform to get the full power of the DEX aggregator into your platform. So head on over to paraswap.io. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how simple it is to use. Just plug in, let's say I wanna swap you know, 0.2 ETH, for USDT, you can see how simple it is. Just plug that in right there and it aggregates over 80 different DEXs. So head on over to Paraswap, P-A-R-A-S-W-A-P dot I-O to use the platform today. All right, let's get back to the show. This is more of a broader question to you, which is you've been around for a while. I'm curious like how you how you think about your strategy and your edge in this market and, and is it constantly changing? Because look, crypto is much different in 2012 than it was in 2014, than it was in 2016. 2018, like this market changed substantially. Um, or are you saying, no, like you, you just stick to your guns and you have a particular strategy? Uh, I'm sort of two questions there, but why don't we start with the first one? Yeah, d definitely. So I, I think on, on the second one, um, you know, we, so we, we take a, a platform approach at Parify. So we really do like three things. We invest in tokens in, in liquid and in private markets. We invest in, in companies in the blockchain space, providing infrastructure. And then the third thing is we're users of the products. So we have uh, a strategy that um, every day we have a team that comes into work and basically just tries to make money using um, DeFi protocols. And we're using them across you know, every, every layer one blockchain and, and layer two environment. Um, I, th I think the best way to learn and find opportunities in this space 
it is to be a user. Like it's very difficult to invest in something and, and not use the product. Um, and, and what you learn from using these products, like the, the thematic insights are incredibly valuable. As you find out, you know, what bridges are good, um, what, you know, as you study the token economics of these networks. So it's, I think being a user has always very much been in our, in our DNA. And that's how we, that, that's how we kind of caught on to DeFi early is we started using these products and it was a required part of our, of our diligence. Um, so I think that's always going to be kind of front and center as I think about Parify is like, you know, users first, uh, um, in, in terms of our approach. Um, and then in addition to being users, I think being active governance participants, um, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and helping networks grow and be safer for users, um, and, and kind of align incentives with, with long-term holders. So I'm, I've always been really yeah. interested in just how these DAOs coordinate and change and, um, the communities that get built. So I think to me, that's first and foremost. Um, and then the second thing I'll say just on kind of maybe how we think differently is I, I think fundamentals, like during certain environments, they may not matter or they may matter less, but the, the pendulum tends to swing back, back and forth. And, and I think long-term, you know, understanding like which networks have user growth and really like mining all the on-chain data that's, that's available, um, can really tip you off to incredible investment opportunities. Um, I mean, we missed Axie, um, or, you know, I, I, I missed Axie. There were, there were, you know, folks that wanted to do it on my, we, on our, on our we team. had, we, we had, we had an allocation in the seed round. It was a small allocation, but like that would have, that would have been a fantastic investment. That, that's, so Luby, but. yeah, I mean, that, that's one of, that's one of my, my many, my, my many misses, but you know, almost like what was more painful than, than missing the seed round was, uh, you know, just not buying in, in liquid markets. Like soon enough and like it was all visible on chain like you could see growth in scholars protocol earnings like the, the axie treasury building up i mean anyone could have seen that and, and jumped into it um so um i i think that you know being really really focused on on fundamentals and and you know not letting it like govern everything you do but but letting it kind of alert you to trends i think is, is a really powerful um tool so two, two questions follow up to that. Um, on the fundamental side, as a user, there are certain things in DeFi that haven't really kind of worked. Uh, there's all this criticism, of course, you know, if you saw the discussion sort of like with Sue and Kane, which was like, look, Ethereum is just very difficult. A certain subset of users, you're priced out, it, it, there's, there's high gas fees and it's going to persist. How, do you, how does that inform your thesis around how other systems like Terra, Cosmos, Polkadot, um, near, for instance, might might evolve. Like, do, do you? I'm just more curious how you see Ethereum relative to other L1s, relative to other ecosystems, as a user, and has that led you to invest in other kind of L1s? Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, the short answer is is yes. Like we've, you know, go, going back a year ago, um, everything we were doing was really on top of Ethereum, and that was where you know 98 percent of all value in smart contracts resided and today you know it's it's shifted and it's maybe like two-thirds of the market um and i expect actually ethereum kind of dot you know smart contract dominance to continue to decline but in in absolute terms continue to grow um so i i, I think there are like a few different paths that like we could take in in this you know uh, in terms of like what the layer one landscape looks like I mean, one, one state of the world, there's, there's one chain that, you know, has all the activity on it um, and, and maybe computations off chain, if that's ETH, or maybe it's on a single, single threaded, you know, chain like Solana. Um, so that's one approach, like one or one potential outcome. The other, the other end of the spectrum is there are many, many different blockchains um, that are application specific. I think the third one, which is probably the most critical is that, uh, credible is that there are two, three, maybe five that actually matter, and then a longer tail of others that are potentially more, more application specific. So what those are, which ones those winners are, I think is, is a really important question. I think it's like diff very difficult to predict. And at this point, the tech um, and the scalability characteristics across a lot of like the non-Ethereum chains that have attracted developers, like there's not much differentiation and it's really just a BD push. Can you get developers to build can you support them? Can you fund them? Um, and, uh, you know, growth begets growth um, because people want to launch applications in environments that have good bridges, good wallets, lots of other applications to benefit from composability. Um, and so um, 
so, so yeah, I, it'll be interesting to see kind of which which of the other L1s win alongside ETH. I find it very difficult to imagine a state of the world where Ethereum isn't isn't one of the few winners and mm-hmm. and e- even the biggest one. Um, so uh, so th- that's kind of how how we see it. And you know certainly we've been investing across mostly at the application layer, and most of these applications deploy across you know many of the layer ones. Ben, I have, a, I have a question about it. So I really like what you said about like become a user, right? It's really important to become a user and it's really important not to just maybe buy the token on Coinbase, but to actually buy it and start using it and set up your own wallet and, and things like that. One, one problem that I've had and I think a lot of other folks in the space have is it's just the opportunity cost. There's so much opportunity cost in crypto. Uh, a, the op- like when you whenever you buy Solana, right? You buy Solana. That's a, that's capital that you're using to buy Solana that you're not using to buy something else that you probably also believe in. So like the one question is how do you just do that's almost like position sizing. And then the second question is when you become a user, right? Like let's say I take a position in Luna, or like in the Terra ecosystem. On one hand I can just buy Luna. On the other hand I can I can start staking that. On the other hand I can actually allocate more capital to like the app layer of the Terra ecosystem. On the other hand, I could maybe allocate capital to like an ecosystem fund. So when you take a position in an L1, uh, how do you allocate across the ecosystem to try to generate the most alpha? Yeah, I mean, I I think about layer ones as as kind of proxy bets on on the ecosystem. And we could have a debate around, hey, should the application layer be worth more than the protocol layer? Where's the better risk return? I think the answer is always um, valuation dependent. Um, and it, and, and really it's also, um, you know, liquidity dependent. So a lot of these, if you look at like any individual application, like the discount rate that I'm applying to it as an investor or kind of what return I'm solving for needs to be higher. Cause I'm betting on a single application, uh, you know, the, the token's probably less liquid. Um, the, uh, the, there's more execution risk. Whereas if you're investing in a layer one, you're kind of buying beta to an ecosystem and it's a little bit more of a, of a proxy bet. Um, and so as we, as you kind of think about it, it really comes down to relative value. Um, so, and it depends on the market environment. So like for Ethereum in 2020 application layer, I think relative to the base chain was more attractive for Solana this past year. I think you saw like the, uh, depending on when you invested the layer one, uh, or the Solana token traded much better than, um, Many tokens that were launched at the application layer, but it's it's always like it's always going to be valuation dependent, um, and um, so so that that's kind of how how you know we we think about it. And have you found that there's more more alpha generated from picking the right sector or picking the right theme? And what I mean by this is uh, the right sector might be like, all right, we're picking DeFi this year, right? We're picking DeFi uh, or we're picking uh, L ones, right? We're going to pick that or excuse me, the sector or like the, um, what I mean by this is actually like the bucket, like the chain. So like, all right, all right, we're going all in on Terra, the Terra ecosystem this year. We're going all in on the Avalanche ecosystem. We're going all in on on just ETH right, right now. The other side of this might be just like the theme and like the sector. So like, uh, instead of picking the chain, it's like we're going all in on DeFi or we're going all in on Metaverse or we're going all in on NFTs this year. How do you guys pick your investments? Is it like chain related? Is it theme and sector related? It's more bottoms up. So we, I mean, because even within what, within any of those categories, I mean, even within Terra DeFi or TeFi is, is what people in the Terra community call it. There are lots of different applications and, you know, the difference between owning the, the best ones and the worst ones is, is dramatic. So um, we really like, first and foremost, it's about finding, you know, great teams to back. And with the acknowledgement that I mean these these applications are portable and can be built and moved on on you know built across multiple blockchains. I mean look at you know Aave or Curve or any of the, the kind of first generation projects. So really it's bottoms up and then being mindful of okay what is what is our overall exposure to um, to the Definity ecosystem to Near to to um, uh, to, to Algorand um, and are we are we investing in um, do, which, what exposure do we have across these different these different environments? Um, but it tends to be more bottoms up in terms of how we look and find find opportunities. Because you can have you can have a, a great sector uh, or a great layer one that's ecosystem that's thriving, a team building in in like a category where there's there's a real need. But if it's the wrong team, 
they're going to under they're, they're going to underperform. So it really has to start with with the team, and then everything else kind of uh, you know com, comes from there. What is what is a sector, a theme, a team? It could be any of or all that is most underappreciated in the market right now. So I, I think it's MakerDAO. Um, <laughs> I could have bet on that. It's it's one of the um, uh, it's. It, it's one of the most successful DeFi protocols. DAI is, is a ubiquitous primitive used in, in a really every, um, every kind of DeFi application. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of approaching 10 billion of, of supply. The network's doing over 100 million of protocol earnings. You have a very dedicated core team that's integrating real world assets that are um, that have a number of like kind of that, that are basically extremely engaged and extremely intelligent and and motivated um, and are just heads down building and they've been able to achieve this all without any liquidity mining without any fancy token economics they've just built a core product that you know has has organic demand um, but um, you know there are there are protocols that are trading many multiples of its valuation that. Um, you know, have, haven't built anything. Um, so I, I think, I think, you know, that's one, that's one that's kind of very much top of mind. And, and Ben, just on the, on the maker side, just cause I, I, I was looking at it last night actually as well. I'm like, this is crazy. They have a $2 billion fully diluted value. Like they're a, they're a pioneer in the space. They basically help create DeFi, right? Seven years in development or five or six, whatever it is built through two bear markets, 10 billion die supply, tens of billions of collateral, right? I feel like they're pretty universally loved and universally used and yet there's this $2 billion fully diluted value. So is this a, when you look at something like that, like, Hey, if I'm, if, if I'm them, I'm pretty pissed off because there's people launching and getting like a $7 billion fully diluted value in like one week. Uh, though I guess that comes down, but if you're maker, like, is this a marketing problem? Is this a community? Like what, what is the issue here? Like why, why isn't that fully diluted value higher? You know, you need, you, you need to tell a story to the market about why, why you're going to grow because I mean, even even a, a, a network or company that's trading at 10 times earnings, you still would have to wait as an investor 10 years to get your principal back. And a lot can happen over that 10 year period. Um, so, uh, you know, multiple expansion or, and, or contraction typically is, is almost more important than, than earnings growth or earnings contraction in terms of driving, driving an, an investment kind of outcome. I think with, with MakerDAO um, specifically, I mean, today you have, you know, like 110 million of, of protocol earnings um, and it's trading at roughly 16, 17 times. I mean, you could say the same thing with Wi-Fi, um, which is also trading at a very low, low multiple. I think what the market's saying is, you know, will, will DAI continue to be relevant in the future? Will it, you know, will it be able to outpace UST or some of these other faster moving competitors? I mean, right now, Terra on a fully diluted basis is at, you know, 75 billion. So call it like, thir you know, uh, 35 to 40 X the valuation of, of, of you know, MakerDAO. Um, so you'd look at that and just say, hey, that, that just can't, like, that doesn't make sense. And maybe you would say, okay, well, Terra is also like a layer one ecosystem. It's more than just a stable coin. And there are certainly trade, you know, trade-offs there. But I, I think it's, I think it's a mark. I think it can be a marketing problem. Most public companies have a head of IR and earnings calls and, and a CEO that's, you know, in the market telling, telling the story. And, uh, you know, with MakerDAO, you have core units that are decentralized globally, but you don't have a figurehead or, or, or leader. Um, and, and that's candidly one thing, like if you look at a network like Synthetics, or if you look at Serum, um, a lot of the most successful DeFi protocols are ones that have traded well, have had that have had that champion that the market really respects um, that, have, that have been telling the story. What, one thing I just want to get your last take on DeFi that I really want to ask you is it feels like a lot of the things that we're talking about, Uniswap, Aave, Compound, Maker, these are almost basic capital markets primitives, right? It's like a lot of spot, lend, borrow, collateral systems. What doesn't really exist right now is like a really robust derivatives market and like complex structured products market and it feels like this has to be coming soon but i'm not deep in that market so i'm just curious like when does this actually get built out 
Yeah, you know, I, I've always been, you know, like that's a cap part of the market that hasn't found product market fit. And um, I, I, I'm kind of skeptical, like, all right, you know, that, that it will like, you know, in, in the near, near to medium term. Um, I, I think that uh, if you think about like what's actually been built in DeFi today, that's at scale, that, that really matters, it's really not much. Like it's, it's spot AMMs and it's, it's lending and borrowing marketplaces. Like that's about it. Like insurance still hasn't really happened. Uh, options haven't really happened. Decentralized perps, they're kind of happening, but it's like a lot of incent it's very incentivized. Um, uh, so, so there still hasn't really been many things that have, that have really been built and, and are at scale. I think part of that is that uh, it's a complexity issue. So the, the number of people that can really dig in and want to use, want to buy like a complex binary option, there may be like, a, a, you know, a few thousand today that actually care to do that. Um, so I just don't think there's a big enough uh, two-sided marketplace for, for those types of products. I I think that, you know, I see, um, I hope they get built and I think they will get built. I'm just unclear on timing. I, but I, I think that for the next wave of growth in DeFi, I think you're probably just going to see further expansion and abstraction of the core DeFi primitives. So lending and borrowing, um, spending. So payments, I think is a big use case. Everyone pays for stuff like three, four times a day. It's the most common financial transaction in the world. And so I think that's that's an untapped use case that hasn't really been explored or the, maybe the market hasn't really been ready for it. Probably gets built off of Ethereum or, or on a layer two. I think that, um, and I think that permission DeFi and kind of abstracted DeFi are in our minds like kind of the two big themes. So, and uh, it's, you know, permission DeFi, like we saw it with Ave Arc, I think you're gonna continue to see it, which is, uh, whitelisted environments for lenders and borrowers to interact and um, engage in financial transactions with with one another. And I could see that world being built on the existing infrastructure in DeFi, uh, but obviously being walled off and uh, KYC AML compliant. And then abstracted DeFi being, you know, these front ends that are getting built. Um, I mean, there are, a t you know, many, many in the market right now um, neo banking apps that offer higher rates that abstract away all the complexity of, of DeFi, DeFi on the back, CeFi on the front, and um, they're a much simple user, uh, much more simple with user experience to enter in and, and access DeFi. How would you? How do you see NFTs and gaming into this equation? Uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of users coming in. You have Axie. You have stuff like certain games that, you know, make gamify finance that make it relatable, make it fun. Is, is this, do you see that as a broad trend or like young, especially younger generations, like your relationship with money, how you think about managing your portfolio can just be gamified and programmed in a very interesting way. And, and are we seeing early innings of that? Like, are you bullish on that? Are you, are you making bets there? Or do you say, look, this is play to earn is not really sustainable. It's kind of like a Ponzi 2.0 and you'd rather just not, not touch it. I think it was the, uh, the, the founder of, of Reddit, who's now, you know, investing in Web3, he, he came out recently that said, you know, we're not going to have gaming without crypto in three to five years time. Um, we're not going to have people playing games without getting compensated in some way for their, their time and attention. Um, so w whether it's Axie or it's another, another the, the play to earn space is obviously growing quickly. I think that is absolutely here to stay. And it's a really interesting way for people to to monetize their their time. Um, I, I you know I'm, uh, I caveat that by saying it's very difficult to I think predict winners and getting like the token economics in these game economies right. You know, within Axie, it's the you know how many axes you need to play, the SLP rewards, the relationship between SLP and AXS. All these variables are we're still kind of experimenting and trying to figure out a way to make them sustainable. But I think the core of play to earn is here to stay and potentially going to onboard more people into crypto than than anything else. Um, I mean, certainly like for me, like DeFi is is more like a B two B institutional um, infrastructure layer, whereas play to earn and NFTs um, are are you know um, B two C B two C or, or really D two C DAO to consumer versus 
you know, DeFi is more D to B, DAO to business, who ultimately then distributes to, to consumers. Ben, this was such an amazing conversation. I'm so grateful that you gave us your time today and on such a crazy day in the market too. I'm sure you must be really busy. I'm going to ask you for one more question here, which I promised you I would ask, which is the audience, the fans would love a little bit of inside baseball. One story, one funny bit tidbit from working with Santiago for a year and a half. So I, I remember... Um, Santiago and I were, were getting ready for a fundraising meeting. This was this was back in like late 2019, early 2020. And um, this is actually yeah, right at the beginning of COVID. So we couldn't take it from from the office and I, I had young kids. And I uh, so he's like, hey, come over to my place to, to do it. So I went over to his place and he's like, hey, you know, I'll, brought me into his apartment. And he goes, hey, I want to show you something. I go, sure. And he walks over to his closet and he opens up his closet. And it was like walking into... Uh, Legoland, like their work, <laughs> Harry Potter castles, um, like these are like you know, two thousand piece Lego sets that probably took like days to put together. Um, so he had the shelves of these different. Um, it, it was almost like a you know Lego Wonderland in there, and I was, I was like, okay, this guy's this guy's like has like a, an absolute Lego obsession, um, and. Um, yeah, and he's so yeah, he's uh that that's my style, Diago, sir. It was, it, was, it was pretty remarkable. That was that would have told you everything about being a JPEG collector. You know, so it's probably easier to collect JPEGs and build Legos. <laughs> and or probably Ben was like, wait a minute, is this guy actually working? Or is he just you know building Legos all day? <laughs> <laughs> we do like the Legos, and we're waiting for Lego to drop NFTs. As soon as Lego drops NFTs, you know they'll take all my money, and and that'll be the end of it. Ben, that was a great story. This was a great episode. I'm sure we will have you back sometime soon, as soon as you're free. So uh, until then, enjoy wait, the... Uh, wait, wait a minute, Jason. Is, is Ben coming to Permissionless? Ben, you should speak at Permissionless. Oh. I mean, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Jason, but we talk, you shield Permissionless all day and you can cl click red buttons and all, all right, this stuff. All right, Ben. You got to get ben, ben, on, ben as a speaker in Permissionless, right? Ben Ben had the best panel at, uh, at our last DAS event. It was Ben, the CEO of Wisdom Tree, uh, Tushar from Multicoin, and uh, Michael Shaulov from Fireblocks. It was an amazing panel. Really, really good panel. I remember the uh, CEO of Wisdom True was commenting about your jacket, your blue jacket. <laughs> yeah. the best one of the day. <laughs> yeah. He was saying we should turn it into an NFT. I, I, need, to, I need to get around to doing that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ben, I will email you. You will, uh, if you want to come down to Palm Beach, May 17th through 19th. We'd love to have Sounds you. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Sounds great. I'm there. Cool. Awesome, guys. Ben, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the pod. Hey, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. I, I enjoyed it.